We are here with Brendan Conway, who is a tabletop RPG designer, co-owner of Magpie Games, and he has designed games such as Avatar Legends, Root RPG, Zombie World, Masks, A New Generation, one of my favorites, and uh, he has worked in the rules design for many other games like Cartel, Urban Shadows, Pasión de las Pasiones, Firefly, we're going to talk about, about uh, handling the intellectual property of other other products. So uh, Brendan is uh, for me and for Leon, and I think that for Puel too, one of our, our favorite uh, game designers. And we have uh, many questions to ask Brendan to get to know him and, and to uh, get ourselves acquainted with this personality of, of the uh, tabletop RPG genre and this creator. So, Brendan, first of all, uh, we are so grateful for you being here in our in our show. Uh, this is uh, really uh, uh, an interview we didn't believe we could have one year ago. Uh, if I, <laughs> right. I don't this... know what uh, Leon and Puel think, but this is uh, really nice having you here and, and being able to talk to, uh, with you. So, my pleasure to be here. <laughs> yeah, this, this is such a treat. I mean, I already showed you the Avatar Legends book, but I want to show it to the audience. I am really huge <laughs> fan of this. <laughs> so let's go. So, uh, Brenda, uh, in an interview with Victory Condition, you told the, uh, the story, what you call the goofy story, uh, of how you enter the world of professional RPG design. Uh, you were trying to help a small convention in New York, uh, this was, is, if, he, if I'm not mistaken, Cristacon uh, 2013. What, what was the story behind that, uh, behind how you became a professional RPG designer? Oof. Yeah, and it's so weird to think back on because it, <laughs> at the time, that's not at all what it felt like. And if I, it's the marker that I put in that I'm like, yeah, that was it. It feels ridiculous in retrospect, but uh, we were doing the convention in New York, Christacon, you got it exactly right, uh, and Mark Diaz Truman was helping to put together the Kickstarter for it, to fund it, to pay for the space. And uh, I was volunteering to run one of the games there. I was going to do a Dungeon World game, and I was kind of building off of this absolutely ridiculous, over-the-top magic item I had written up for Dungeon World, this the angel bone blade and this giant epic, like I wanted it to be just madness of, of fantasy nonsense. So I built a whole little scenario and adventure off of it. And I said for the Kickstarter, one of the things we could do uh, to help provide a reward to people who backed is just share that little write-up, share that, that adventure that I was gonna run. Uh, and Mark was like, sure, but we can do that. That's, that's a nice little, toss in the pod it's not a big deal so uh time came for me to write it up and turn it in and i wrote like forty thousand words uh and mark was like this is how dare you uh you monster and he's like we're gonna make this a book now i guess i guess it's gonna be a book great uh so i started working with mark on turning that into the last days of angle kite uh the dungeon world supplement book which we then kickstarted uh, separately, but we gave to everybody who kickstarted the Christicon as well. And that's kind of the start of my own work. And then somewhere interwoven, it's so hard for me to keep the timelines straight because it feels these independent projects, like they are completely separate and they never touch, but they were happening at the same time. I started working with Mark on, on Firefly, on the Firefly role-playing game. Of course. So this, uh, this first Kickstarter was in fact the, the first long-term product you you had written like yeah we, we had a we have a quote for uh, mark said like last week brendan turned his first draft <laughs> Thirty-five thousand words of monsters <laughs> companion classes locations and disease and fonts <laughs> it's like uh, amazing first product <laughs> like <laughs> It's the, the thing now where I'm like, I'm much more aware of the standards <laughs> of the thing I did is actually kind of a no-no. If your editor says, turn in 10,000 words and you turn in three to four times that, you're actually in trouble. That's So I am really lucky it worked out. 
Yeah, you, the, the, you didn't have the uh, parameters right. <laughs> exactly. I was like, well, I was Blue like, more up. words, more is better. More is just better, right? I like it. <laughs> it was a lot. <laughs> so, most of the thing, the things you have designed, uh, are powered by the apocalypse, or are at least are heavily inspired by that framework. How did you come to know PBTA? Ooh, that's a great question. So. I, let's see, I think I was playing it uh, shortly after it came out uh, in a couple of ways, but the most important was I played a really long, full campaign of just Apocalypse World uh, that was taking me inside and out of everything, seeing how all of it fit together, and it was rapidly becoming one of my favorite games, and uh, so much of what it did I loved, and that particular campaign I loved, the story we told I loved. I was running it then at conventions and, and just because it was it was the game that I loved and it was for me satisfying uh, a lot of the holes that I had experienced running other games. I, they weren't quite what I wanted. They weren't quite the thing that I was looking for and running Apocalypse World was like, oh my God, this is it. This is what I've been looking for this whole time. Let's run this and then I'm gonna rope that other group I run games for. We're gonna play Apocalypse World now. And so I, I became the evangelist as much as I was converted to this religion. Uh, so that was all just from Apocalypse World itself. And then I played Monster Hearts and I was like, oh, even more. This is a, a different <laughs> Powered by the Apocalypse game, but it's still so good. And it's doing what I want in so many ways. And that's kind of how I got into it, was just playing and playing and playing and loving every minute of it. And then eventually sort of saying, so what else can I do with this? Like I kind of, I'm, I, I want to adapt it to the very specific thing I want. I want my dungeon world, but I want it to be over the top epic fantasy. How can I make that happen? And, and those little questions, how can I make it better fit the thing that I'm interested in today started essentially designing. They, they, they led me to design new things for the system. And why do you design within this framework, within uh, BBTA, as opposed to others? Because almost all the products you help design are either BBTA or heavily inspired by BBTA. Why do you keep designing in this framework? So partly it's because we really just love the framework and we love the tools it provides. Partly it's because there is just a commercial element to it of you know, as Magpie becomes known for some of its PBTA work, that makes it easier to connect the dots. But we've also learned over time that there are uh, relatively few, it seems, people who just jump from PBTA thing to PBTA thing. They they like the thing they like. They like young superheroes or they like uh, Bluebeard's Bride and its horror. And the fact that both of them are PBTA doesn't necessarily link it. Uh, so in the end, what it comes down to is our continued familiarity and development with those tools and our interest in that system. So we can always build on the last thing we did. We can always take those tools and, and adapt them a bit and start to realize this doesn't exactly fit, but maybe if we did this and changed it a little bit, it'll fit, which means we're never building from scratch. Uh, that provides a huge benefit moving forward as we can sort of tweak and adjust the designs. But all that said, we're, we're reaching the point where we're starting to look at and think about, like, cool, if we were to do something new, would we go completely outside of PBTA design? What would we play with? What would that mean? What are the things that we think PBTA, for all that it can do great, what can't it do? What can't it do that we might want to design a new system for? So that's becoming the question we're facing today. Well, so after many years of PBTA, like, <laughs> you... We heard that uh, in many interviews, you said like uh, powered by the apocalypse is more of a framing device than a system in it and itself. Like it is something Yeah, you you just said something like that. Would you elaborate? Like, what do you mean by like a framing device against a system? For sure. Uh, I think the best way to put it is that uh, masks and let's say Cartel, which Mark Diaz Truman designed and wrote, uh, are both PBTA games. Their system, however, is wildly different. Uh, 
uh, in that they produce wildly different outcomes. They they don't actually create stories that are that similar in so many respects. And that's because the systems are actually the individual combinations of the elements. It's this acknowledgement that uh, for any given PBTA game, exactly what moves you have, exactly what resources you have, the stats, those things really define it more than just the PBTA uh, but that's like a starting point. That is a notion of how we're approaching this. We're approaching it as role playing as a conversation. We wait until you say something that maybe triggers a move. We roll the moves. But the way you can kind of tell what I mean is you can rip out lots of different elements and it still has those core ideas without those things. Do you need playbooks for a PBTA? Not really. Do you need two six sided dice? We design Zombie World with cards, so there are no dice in it at all. Uh, the things that make PBTA PBTA are not any of those things that we usually think of as the system. It's instead this kind of like ideological framework for how the game should work. Wow. Uh, I just kept thinking, and if, if I know other frameworks, uh, you know, RPG, I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, we usually we think that like there is a framework behind the old school revolution stuff uh, uh, right. th that's the style of play that's like um, I have uh, X tools how do I use X tools to solve Y puzzle problem uh, how, and, and the system better reflect like the physics straightforwardly because I'm trying to problem solve puzzle solve using the specific tools I have in that moment that's a completely different framework than PBTA. Like, right. they, that would make no sense in, in Powered by the Apocalypse viewpoint. And all of that's to say, of course, like, they're just very different ways of playing. It's not like one is inherently better than the other. It's that what I am looking for at a given moment is most likely served by a particular framework, which of those frameworks, which of those particular games in that framework am I interested in going for at this moment? Right. Okay. So going back to BBTA, just let's stay here sure. for a while. Uh, the game is almost defined by the moves, you know, like when you trigger a move. Yeah. Uh, how does the process of defining a core move is in a PBTA game? So, yeah, that thing I said before, it feels like cheating, but it's honestly, <laughs> it's, it's really good advice just in general for anybody designing, I think. The, when we start designing the core moves of the game, we uh, never start from scratch. We never say, let's invent seven whole new moves that nobody has ever seen before. We kind of say, I'm going to take that one from Apocalypse World, or I'm going to take that one from Mass, I'm going to take that one from Cartel even. I'm going to take them from a bunch of different games that kind of seem like they fit, put them together. Do they fit? Uh, I'll play test it. Are they producing what I'm looking for? Uh, am I getting what I wanted? If not, maybe something has to change. Uh, if so, great. I mean, why would I break something that's not broken? Why would I try to fix it if this combination of those tools is already achieving the effect? The advantage of just so much of this history of design now that even, even though PBTA has only been around for like a decade, uh, there's still so much iteration and implementation that you can do this and you can always build off of these things that already exist. I'll, I'll always say masks began because uh, there was that cover of an issue of X-Men that had X-23, uh, the young girl clone of Wolverine kissing the time displaced young version of Cyclops. And I was like, this is a bonkers cover and I want a game <laughs> that can produce this moment and my starting point was not clear the slate I'm gonna start from scratch my starting point was Monster Hearts right. so I was like Monster Hearts does messy teen romance why would I not just go to this game that already does this so well and see if it can work and part of that process was seeing like oh but Monster Hearts is doing a very particular kind of messy teen romance that fits the supernatural teen romance shows great doesn't quite fit the superhero stuff that I'm looking for. Let's adapt this and see which of these moves don't make sense for what I want, which do make sense for what I, what I want, which can kind of be painted over and adjusted to do what I want. So are you still planning to 
keep designing uh, within this framework or but because you said something quite interesting uh, just a while back or are you looking for new horizons do you think that there is something uh, in in the horizon uh, for your ideology for your way of thinking about game design uh, have you uh, received everything that or, or done everything that could be done with pbta do you feel that perhaps the system has its limitations what what do you have in store for that i mean are you looking uh, ahead of pbta it, we definitely think it has limitations uh which is not it's not intended as a like it sucks it's just natural like no no game can ever be anything or sorry can never be everything yeah. um there are things that it can't do in particular the phrase we use is uh often it has a hard time with kind of um high context stable societies these these cultures where like there are lots and lots of rules uh and those rules stick around They're not in constant upheaval and turmoil. Things are not changing every five seconds. Uh, we think, uh, off the top of my head, uh, like a, a very rigid kind of uh, deep social rules. You, you must say the right thing when you enter the ballroom or else everybody will look at you aghast. Almost Jane Austen-like uh, kind of setup. That's not exactly what PBTA does well because PBTA does well at Things are going to change, though. Tomorrow, something absolutely out of left field can happen and rewrite everything you know about everything, and that's great. It's constantly at risk. There's constant tension. You think about masks, crazy supervillain shows up, and new stuff happens, and who, who could have seen that coming? Cartel. Well, today, somebody said the wrong thing, and El Narco is now going to come after you and end your life. What are you going to do? Um, All of it has the sense that, like, everything's in flux. Nothing is stable. You can't count on the ground beneath your feet. So we're sort of looking at, um, as, a, as an example of a game that does the other side, uh, a lot of people around the office love the game Burning Wheel by Luke Crane. And Burning Wheel is this sort of uh, fantasy game, but it has lots of really deep, intricate rules for creating your character. And it has this whole cycle of play that's really extended. Uh, to build up your skills and, and focus on your beliefs and you're fighting for what you believe. But the overall result is the world is not like constantly changing and cutting yourself up. It's much harder and much more solid uh, than a PBTA world. And so that's kind of a space that we're looking at. It's like this more, uh, here's the setting. The setting is much more stable. Your characters are going in a longer journey that's not necessarily quite as like chaotic it's much more yeah but tomorrow you're gonna still be here in court in the castle serving the king trying to argue with the king uh and that's gonna keep going for a while it's not gonna be undermined because in session two the king is assassinated and then in session three the queen who took over from the king is also assassinated and then in session four the necromancer who killed them both is assassinated like that's very pbta that's definitely a thing that has happened in dungeon world games that i've run but that's not this other kind of storytelling which is almost the games game of thrones -y and like you need the full season to build up to that moment of death yeah it's shocking when ned stark dies but spoilers sorry it's shocking when ned stark dies but like it, you have to build up to it there has to be the sense of it is a more stable society that's not just going to explode every five seconds uh, with a whole brand new surprising thing that undermines everything. Um, in particular, I'll say for myself, one of the designs, I, I first featured this a couple years ago, and then this game called Avatar had to be made, and so things kind of you know got shifted around on a schedule. But Armored Society is a game that I have been noodling on, thinking about, and working on for a long time now. Uh, it was inspired by my love of kind of Irish mythology, my love of Game of Thrones. Uh, I wanted to get a little bit of the Austin romance, uh, uh, you know, manners, politeness, social rules. So that's one of the spaces that I myself am looking into is this idea of uh, an Irish mythology inspired 
socio-political story where your characters are in a world vying within the world fighting for power within the world but it's not like devoid of these rules everybody cares about the society and it's not like tomorrow everything's going to be tossed out the window grab your gun and i hope you survive <laughs> like some sense of cohesiveness like yes you need that the, the frame the, 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 the setting to be a little cohesive so the immersion doesn't break so easily <laughs> no it's that something that's exactly it. Like I masks, I, I will say over the course of a long time of playing masks, there's this tension of uh, can you really change the society? Should you? Ch is that what the story is about? It's totally a thing that people do all the time. But the game itself, obviously, fo is focused on you and your feelings and who you are. It's not really focused on the world at large. So that means that there is that lack of cohesion. There's that thing of, I have to say, Halcyon City has seen it all. It doesn't matter that a T-Rex is walking down the street. They've got guys to fix that. It's fine. Don't, don't think about it. I'm not going to think about the socio-political ramifications of Dr. Doom inventing a power source controlled by ghosts. <laughs> not, I'm not going to, I'm not going to worry about that. Yeah, and then, so that fits perfectly the PBTA framework but any story that wants to ask those questions, that wants to say, right, but Iron Man designed a tiny little thing that can power a city. How would that change the world? Yeah. That's not a PBTA thing. <laughs> we have other systems for that. Exactly. Yeah. The, I hear what you say, like, there is um, a big thing to, to, to maintain uh, present uh, thinking, well, this is a system for these things, and with those other things, it's not so great. It doesn't work profoundly. I, I would like to just give you what I don't know if about these two things or about another thing, but what is the hardest part of uh, designing a game with the PBTA framework? Is it about this, or there are other, other things that? stumble in the way mm, it's, a, it's a great question so there there are um there are a few technical answers that i can kind of give about the difficult elements to design and making sure they fit um you know it, it, at its most basic one of the most important things i would say is just you gotta play test the heck out of it and, and that just takes time like you gotta play test it you gotta take the feedback see it didn't work and cycle it through. But that's true of all game design. That's yeah, not that's PBTA's. universal. Right. So, so the thing I would say that's super important and subtle and hard in a way that's kind of surprising is there's always a point in all of the games that we've done um, where we have to be able to say, what is this game actually about? And the answer there is not about teen superheroes man they're they're dressed up in costumes and it's great if that's the answer it's missing its heart it's missing something to make it go uh it's missing the thing that people can connect with i am like always so shocked and delighted to find out people connecting their experiences to masks when i'm like i wrote it about my experiences which is a particular subset but i i was trying to get a thing out of me into the game and that heart successfully still can connect with people today we you have to be able to find that thing and it's so easy to just go forward and be like no but this is about a spaceship we're on a spaceship and we've got space guns and it's about being awesome with our spaceship and our space guns i love our spaceship and our space guns and i'm gonna be like right but what what's the heart what is it actually doing what is it actually saying do your mechanics connect to that heart is it about family? Is it about fighting for what's right and what that costs? What actually am I connecting with on a deeper, higher level that goes beyond the trappings? Uh, that's a very difficult point because sometimes that means you stare at it and you're like, it's not about anything. And that means you have to ask yourself the incredibly difficult question. Do I go back to the drawing board? and and reinvent this or do i even just abandon it entirely because it doesn't have the heart um i i think nearly every game that survives that lasts 
for a long time people keep coming back to and playing has this has this thing you can find and connect with uh and so that for us is always the hard part because we can start off and we can be super excited ah it's like uh space adventure and we're super excited to do a star wars e ppta thing that we're just cooking up and then the thing that kills it for us is that moment of right but is it doing anything well no not really and of course i mean there's there's a couple of other things we've learned over the time there's a moment of we have to say what is it as a product who is it going to sell to uh what does it look like as a book those are also super important but i think the hardest part is this not obvious thing that as a designer it's easy to just be so excited and thrilled by the thing you've put together the little contraption and say oh it's so good and never ask this really hard question uh, sorry i i would like to steal the the next question but i would like to is there like a design purpose that happens when this this very same thing you explained bleeds into the game like um i'm a very big D, &D nerd like i'm focused on that and many of the advices and things that i find in internet and i think that for most games are like the best way to develop your games uh, as a player or as a as a gm is to find that core uh, engine like uh, the heart of the thing that you can summarize in a in a simple phrase it's like the same design uh, issue that bleeds into the table it's like is there any correlation between those things i think hmm, it's, a, it's a it's a good question it's tough so i'll i'll say from the perspective of a designer my goal is to put that heart of the game into the game so well everywhere that if you're running the game by the rules I gave you, that heart, that theme, that idea is going to show up, whether you're aware of it or not. I think as a GM and as a player, being aware of it, knowing that it's there, playing towards it, makes it so much better makes it come to life make sure no nobody is annoyed right that the classic i think for me for masks is there have been times when people are like i don't get it i just want to hit things with my superpowers why are you making me talk about my feelings and i'm like okay well something didn't connect here uh but it it's still there the reason why they're mad is because masks forces you to confront what it wants you to focus on Uh, so I still, I want everybody at the table to know about it. I know a GM who's got that in their head, who's got that in their heart, is going to play to it, make it come to life. So there's absolutely a thing where the GMs are, well, I mean, obviously, the GMs always make the game real. The players make the game real. I can only ever do so much with a book. Uh, <laughs> but my goal is to give every possible tool I can and to subtly put it in there so that all you've got to do is follow the rules and something will start sparking into life. And then the GM and the players take it the rest of the way and finish it. They take it to full birth of some glorious, wonderful new story that's all theirs that I could never have predicted or told on my own. Uh, and that partnership is, of course, delightful and wonderful, uh, but it's the thing for me on my side is like, I can only take the ball so far, but I gotta take it that far. I gotta do everything I can to make sure it's doing the thing I wanted so that there's no point where the GM can come to me and say, I ran the game exactly like you told me to. And it was terrible. Or like, there was no heart. There was no soul. It said nothing. That's my failure. That's the thing I am desperately trying to avoid is the GM who's really trying to adhere to the rules I give them, the tools I give them. And then they're still not getting it. Okay, so let's go again with Mask now. Um, Mask has been received uh, by the player base as one as one of the best uh, PBTA games ever. Actually, I, I I don't know if you ever heard this, but uh, a friend of Mask a friend of mine says that is the most elegant PBTA that he ever read. 
Uh, why do you think uh, it was so well received? Gosh. Uh, if I could just repeat a formula that made math do it over <laughs> and over again, that'd be great. <laughs> I think that there's obviously a lot going on there. Uh, I, I would be lying if I didn't take into account, like, superheroes have seen a massive jump in American media over the course of the past, whatever, 10, 15 years. And as I was riding that wave hard, uh, <laughs> happily riding that wave. So, like, that's part of it. Uh, just familiarity with the concepts, with the style. Uh, there's also, though, the fact that uh it's hitting those teen stories which have perennially they, like year after year after year after year after year they are uh popular in whatever form uh so i'm i'm also hitting a kind of story that never goes after fashion because there's always young people growing up and old people being now one of them myself <laughs> uh can always be like yeah no i i i remember this i went through this yeah yeah <laughs> no, I got it. Glad I grew out of it, but I remember this. So we like, there's always something to connect to. Uh, but I, I think that honestly, what I would hope for, this is the thing I, I feel weird about taking credit for and saying this with certainty. Uh, but the thing I would hope for is this thing of connection, of being able to find yourself somewhere in that game, uh, and and have it mean something to you. Because even if I'm writing it about Uh, things I was feeling, things I was thinking as I was 18, 19, 20, 21, as I, and I was trying to somehow put a lot of that into the game. I'm hoping that you are finding, yeah, I remember this. I hope that you are like, this playbook, this playbook is me. This playbook is that experience I had. Uh, these moves, I remember this moment where, no, it wasn't about the giant robot dinosaur. I remember the moment where I told my dad to go to hell and that was that was me rejecting his influence that was that moment oh my god um that's the thing i think that works the best is is when you're able to say even for all the trappings of the the purple tights and the capes and the lightning powers which you know admittedly are really fun but like it's that thing of oh my god i told i told this girl that i loved her and then she said She just wanted to be friends, and 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 that's fine. But like my my heart, my little heart is crushed, and and I'm gonna mark that condition, and I'm hopeless now. And that entire cycle, recognizing it, seeing yourself in it, um, I think is is hopefully <laughs> that I think is is the the hopeful best reason why people keep playing it, why it keeps going, is because it's able to achieve these moments. Uh, in addition to everything else I said, in addition to it gets the benefit of people saying, oh, I know how a superhero story goes. I know that it's not really about do we win, because superheroes basically always win. Like, even after that one movie where they kind of didn't win for a while, they then won uh, later. It just happened later. The stories about what happened along the way, who they became, how they changed, what did they have to face to get to that final point where they won. And so people are able to draw on their knowledge of the genre in addition to hopefully get connecting to it on an emotional level. So let's go, let's go there. Uh, in an interview with uh, Terrible Warriors and in many other interviews, you said that the masks uh, came to be as a mixture of what you saw in that uh, X-Men uh, cover and the emotions and feelings uh, you felt when you were young, um, adults were telling you who you had to be, what you had to feel, etc. Do you always search for this kind of self-reflection in all of the games you design? I, I do try to find it, I do try to connect with it on that level, and it, it's exactly that thing I said before, that's hard. It's not easy to always find yourself Uh, and it depends on the game as well. It depends on our purposes. Like, there's a world in which uh, we spent ages and ages and ages longer with every single game that we've done in order to really find this connection. And, you know, the nature of publishing is that sometimes you got to put out a game. Uh, Zombie World, I'm not 100% sure I would say. I, I have deeply connected with the sensation of being in a zombie apocalypse. It came out 
right in the middle of COVID. So to be fair, the pandemic hadn't yet happened. Uh, so like, I couldn't draw that connection. Uh, but like, it's still, it's doing the thing I wanted it to do. And I still was able to find elements of that. Or like in Zombie World, I would say in particular, there's this whole mechanic uh, where you get your cards and your past is face down and your trauma is face down. So you know what they are, but nobody else at the table knows what they are. And there's this whole thing about like hiding pieces of yourself from the people that you have to work with on a daily basis. Like, do you reveal that you used to be a criminal or a cop? Both of those are possible pasts. Do they even matter at the moment? How are the other people gonna react if they find that out? And then of course, there are a couple that are just straight up bad that you like never ever wanna reveal. Uh, but so I'd say like that's a thing, right? That's still in me. That's an experience. How much, how much do I reveal of myself, of where I've been, of who I am now, of any of the baggage that I'm carrying? Do I want anybody to see that at the moment? Uh, so there's a piece of that in Zombie World. So for every game, there's at least something in there that I'm like, yes, okay, this, this is a real human experience that we can draw on and connect with. Um, even though Root is about tiny little anthropomorphic animals adventuring in a bizarre medieval world, there's stuff in there that we can find and connect with on a human level. We can say, like, what does it feel like to be a little guy with a giant organization above me that thinks about me, thinks about me positively, or thinks about me very, very negatively? Uh, how do I deal with that? Do I care what they think? How am I going to deal with it when they come to my door one day because they hate me? Uh, that's a thing that, again, I think it exists. You can connect with it's a human thing, even though, again, in the game, it's obviously rather exaggerated and fantastical. Um, so I, I search for that every single time. But there are some games that are much more like, yeah, Masks is this thing that I was writing by myself at the time to start and uh it, it did not have to fulfill any particular function and it wasn't based on an existing property so that means that there's almost inevitably much more of me in it than like you know avatar there's definitely me in it but avatar i'm working on it with an awesome team of people it's based on this property that has what is it seven seasons of television and a bunch of graphic novels and like there's space to tell so many more stories but the requirements of that project just inherently mean there's a little bit less of me because there's more of everything else that I just said. Yeah, we can we can see that. But I, there's a thing. Must is a game where players play teenagers hero, teenage heroes that, yeah. among other things, fight villain, villains. Yet the game has no hit points or wounds. When did you have that? Um, like. Epiphany <laughs> that a game about superheroes doesn't need necessarily uh, those subsystems. Like, is there anything about what you just said? Like, you yourself pouring into the design, is there anything uh, specifically about this? The, so, so, it's a convergence of a few things, but the honest starting point. Uh, as I look sheepishly off to the side, is that there was a design problem there. Uh, I am a Hawkeye fan. I love Hawkeye. Hawkeye um, has a bow. That's it. Uh, like, he's, he's athletic and stuff, but, you know, he's not peak physical condition uh, like Captain America or something. He's, he's not like a Black Panther who's empowered by the heart-shaped herb. He's a guy with the bow and I needed him to be able to be in the game <laughs> next to the Hulk <laughs> and have it function. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, if I do anything that tracks like their physical well-being, it's never going to work. Hulk is going to have 5 million hit points and Hawkeye has 20. Uh, it's just, it's not possible for me to make it work. And then when I'm looking at the actual stories where Hawkeye is next to the Hulk, where these characters of massively different power levels are next to each other, I'm like, how do they do it? How does um, Young Justice put Robin, who obviously protege of Batman, very, very capable, but still he's just like a kid. He's a, he's a capable kid. 
But he is sitting next to Superboy, who's half Kryptonian and nigh invulnerable and incredibly strong. How do they sit next to each other? And the answer is, it's not really about how much damage does Superboy take in that moment. It's about, well, when Superboy takes damage, it makes him pissed off. When Robin takes damage, it makes him reckless. Uh, and the the GM of those shows and those comics, such as there is the GM, is basically saying, yeah, I mean, I'm never going to have uh, Zod punch Robin in the chest uh, <laughs> because if he did, Robin dies. So I just don't do that. That I just don't make that particular move. And instead, I'll always allow it to be the thing where he backhands you, Robin, and you just go flying off and tumble. And you're like, oh, no. And it hurts but it never really lands. As long as we're all okay on the, the genre tropes that for some reason, you know, Zod only ever backhands Robin. He doesn't like just laser him into nothing. As long as we're okay with Kang does not come after Hawkeye and be like, okay, but now you don't exist. Uh, and instead Hawkeye just kind of gets brushed off and Hulk is the one who gets targeted with the giant plasma ray then I can hit this thing of actually, though, there's still consequences to both because I'm focused on their emotional state. And then, of course, later it comes into, okay, so now I have this idea. I'm going to focus on their emotional state. How do I do that? What does being angry do to you? It makes you worse at certain things. How do I get rid of angry? I act really shitty uh, for a moment. I do something that I really shouldn't, like a dumb teenager. Uh, that whole piece is something that I connected to on a personal level, but like that starting point of uh, I can't have hit points was very much a design question of how do I have these two characters who coexist in the stories? How do I have them coexist in my game? The answer is that I can't care about this thing that seems obvious to care about uh, because it just will never ever work. I need to care about some other piece of this that actually puts them together onto the same line. Hulk can be angry, Hawkeye can be angry. Uh, voila, suddenly I am able to put these characters next to each other. Amazing. Yeah, th uh, that's really tricky. Um, if you were to design mask today, did it change anything? Is it, if there is something that you would like to add or modify? No, it's perfect. It's perfect. <laughs> this game has no flaws. Whoever designed it is just a genius. <laughs> it's a good question. There are definitely, uh, like, I would go back and I would look at the text. I would look at uh, explaining things. I would see if I can explain them better. But the couple of things that I think I would probably take a really hard look at, uh, I would take a look at the moments of uh, celebration, the sort of the two team moves. Um, so those were derived from uh, Apocalypse World had the had its sex moves because sex is a thing in Apocalypse World and it wanted to underline and say this is a moment that matters. Uh, I and, and Monster Hearts, I think as well. Uh, it's been a while since I played it, but I'm pretty sure it also has its own sex moves. Sex is a thing in Monster Hearts and the stories that they're telling. I was like, it's it's not as much of a thing in the stories that I'm basing it on, but what are a thing are these moments where everybody fist bumps each other and they say, yeah, and, and everybody's excited. So I wanted to make sure those happened. If I didn't have anything there, uh, people weren't doing that moment. That moment, it wasn't really showing up. Uh, the way that like comfort and support as a basic move was the key to getting those moments of the two friends on the rooftop, one of them is comforting the other. Uh, I was like, okay, this is my this is my quick way to get everybody high fiving at the end of a fight. Um, the effect, though, is much more like it's it's rote. You always have the same move every time. It's generally beneficial. I guess I'm going to hit the same thing every single time. It doesn't change. It doesn't keep up to date with the progression of the character. At some point, I think a lot of groups just kind of stop using them. Uh, because they stop being interesting. I've already seen it triggered five times. It's not fun to see it triggered another five. I'd go back and take a look at those and really ask hard questions about, is there a better way to do this? Is there a way I can make them uh, more adaptive? Is there a deeper set of options I can use here? How can I make them better to do the things that I want? Uh, and the other big piece, just off the top of my head, I would take a hard look at the GM advice. Um, because there's a whole set of things here about, or it's, I should say, the long-term play GM advice. 
There's a whole thing about hooks and arcs. And and I'm actually pretty happy with how that system ultimately played out, how it guides you to create superhero-like stories. But it's exactly the thing that I would say I'm now many years out. I've done several more games since then. I would come back and look at it hard and be like, is this actually the thing I want to say? Is this actually needed? Is there a better way to do these ideas? Uh, I have a feeling I would be much more equipped to come up with a solution than I, I was back then. Not not that I don't think it works, but I think probably that could be refined, that could be improved. So, changing a little bit uh, the subject, uh, you've recently worked in Avatar Legends, you have also worked in uh, Root, the RPG based on the board game, you worked in the Firefly RPG, one of your uh, first uh, uh, jobs or, or gigs as a uh, RPG designer, is there any difference when you are designing a game that relies on existing intellectual property? Um, does the work uh, change the way you, you approach the design process? For sure. It, it absolutely uh, has a lot of subtle and obvious differences that happen at different stages. Uh, and it depends heavily on the nature of the, the property that you're deriving from. You know, working on Root, um, there was a board game. And it's an incredibly successful board game. Uh, but that's all there was, as a board game. And the board game doesn't have a ton of lore in it to start. And, you know, working with leader games is great. Uh, they, they're great people, and they were great to talk to. But a lot of it came down to, we need to fill in the blanks uh, on this board game and, and the lore that it has. Uh, in a way that you know they just it, it it hadn't necessarily come up so far uh they had they had their ideas but they hadn't had to codify it we had to ask weird questions to them like we had to be like okay so the marquise de cat is like a french kind of thing does that mean everything cat related should be kind of french is that is that the scheme that you want is that how we should think about that uh that was a completely different process where we couldn't just necessarily make decisions we couldn't just be like Yes, that's what we're doing. We had to ask the questions. We had to check with them, make sure we were honoring their amazing work and doing what they thought uh, made sense and build on that. For Avatar, we come in, as I said, there's seven seasons of the show. There's a bunch of graphic novels. There's a wiki that is put together by fans who are so devoted, it is ridiculously comprehensive. It calls out tiny little moments from every little episode. It becomes a fantastic tool for me. <laughs> um, but, but I mean, it's a totally different experience. Like I, there, there's building to be done, but there's much more codification. There's much more writing down what's already true uh, and, and just putting that on the page and honoring what's already true. Like, when we talk about what can airbending do, we can ask questions, but there's already a ton of answers. We know what airbending can do. So I'm building off of that and just trying to put it into the system, as opposed to necessarily inventing whole new things that airbending can do and like building on it massively. And again, that's working with uh, like CBS Viacom and the team at Avatar Studios, uh, and they're great to work with and they produce, provide feedback and they keep us honest and they keep us on track, but it's an entirely different relationship than just doing it on our own, where we can just be like, yeah, whatever. We'll just make up the answer ourselves, it's fine. Uh, for, with this, we have to be like, is this completely acceptable with the eight other projects you guys are working on away from us that we don't even get to see? Does this all fit together into a cohesive, comprehensive world like it's simultaneously not our job entirely to keep track of all that because that's why we bring them into the conversation and also we need to try our best to honor that and try our best to be true to all of that it's a constant back and forth in a way that you know masks obviously is not if i if i did masks in marvel and it would be like i have to honor everything that has been established about every single piece of marvel that would be a massively different experience than me just being able to go like yeah i mean whatever like this guy's i guess this thing i don't care like aegis is aegis it's fine it's it's an acronym i thought was fun so let's just get, let's just move on it's obviously shield everybody knows it's shield <laughs> but it's aegis it's different it's totally different I, i'm telling you it's, 
It's not chocolate, it's chocolate raspberry. Um, so it's freeing to be able to do it yourself. Uh, it's because you, you're able to navigate and make those decisions as you need. You're able to bring your vision to life. But of course, working with the property gives you that structure, gives you that ability to be like, okay, but I'm building on something that exists. I'm supported by that structure. I have to honor that structure and it binds me a bit, but I also get all of the benefits of that. The questions are answered. Uh, and, and obviously I have a ton of people who are already invested in it, who are already on board with that vision. And, and they're gonna keep me honest in their own way. They're gonna play test the game and they're gonna be like, no, this isn't right. This doesn't honor the show. This isn't how the show worked. And I'm gonna be like, okay, actually that's helpful. Let me figure out how I can better honor the show. Um, and of course, the last piece is that it, without the Avatar show, I don't get to write a move and name it Bonzu Pippin Padalopsicopolis the third, because uh, somebody would have told me I can't do that. Um, in this case, I uh, I got I got away with it. <laughs> That's amazing. So, in, in the same situations like working with uh, IP previous IPs, like how does one approach the IP holders of to tell them? <laughs> Hey, we want to make a, table, a tabletop RPG uh, out of your show. <laughs> How does that uh, work? So the, there is definitely this like leveling up of the company, of the business side of things. Uh, one of the most important things I would say is we have an agent uh, and she is amazing and she can represent us to other bigger corporate entities and she can say like, we're interested she can open those lines of inquiry and of course for a lot of them the response is completely different because they're able to say like they're approaching us as professionals to professionals this is entirely a business level environment we can respond business to business as opposed to us being like we just love your work can we can we just like get get your game we're just so excited and of course that's what we're actually like over here you know when we're like thrilled about the idea of what things could we possibly do but putting on that business level face, being able to have an agent and connect us uh, makes a huge, huge difference. So I'd say that's one of the most important pieces. Even if you're not gonna have an agent, it's basically like thinking about it as you're approaching a business. That has to be a completely business to business level exchange. It can't be, um, I'm just so excited to do this. I love your property so much. That helps, that's not nothing. But the business has to be able to say, but why would I go with you? What do you bring to the table that those other guys who are also fans don't? Uh, what are you going to promise me? A lot of the time with licenses, uh, you have to put up a bunch of money up front uh, in order to essentially buy the license rights for some amount of time because that's their proof that you're serious and that you can actually back this up. Um, with, with Root, we had the advantage of Leader Games is a small company. We are a small company. Our CEO contacted their CEO and said, "Hey, what about this?" Uh, and th that had that had a certain advantage to it as well. And so that's like the difference of Avatar, this giant property, and Root, this incredibly successful board game, but still the the crown jewel of a smallish company that matches us. So a lot of it is like keeping things synced up to the level of the property you're going after. The bigger the property, the more likely they're gonna see it in a purely business sense. And it's gotta be framed in an entirely professional, entirely business level. Uh, the advantage I would say is like, if you're going for a board game license, there's a good chance that they're a small company too. And you might be able to get in touch directly with them. We're, we're never gonna get directly in touch with like the people in charge of Avatar right out of the gate. There's like 30 different gatekeepers between us and them that we have to talk to, show that we're serious, prove ourselves to before we can get to that moment. I, I honestly think Magpie of basically any other age before we got that license could not have gotten that license. We had to have done Root to prove this is what we did with a board game. Think of what we might be able to do with your property before we even had a shot. <clears throat> yeah, it seemed difficult. <laughs> so, um, going to the board games. Uh, in an interview with the Story Told RPG podcast, you said that you started playing uh, TTRPGs by playing a box of AD&D that came with another game that was almost a board game. 
Then several years later, you designed Root, as you said, an RPG based on the board game. Then Zombie World also has a board game. Uh, do you often look towards board games for inspiration with this, when designing RPGs? Absolutely. I, I love the board game space. I love uh, how much innovation there is. Uh, I love this, like, it, it obviously it has its edges and its, its darker sides, but the board game community is this, like, incredibly uh, focused community of, of uh, right, but this doesn't exactly work. Let's let's criticize that that exact mechanic and rip out that exact, and I'm like, yes! More of that! <laughs> I love it! Um, so I, I love that whole space. I love the emergent storytelling that's becoming more and more of a thing in board games. This idea that uh, just by the system, it'll produce a tale. Uh, it'll feel like we played through a story without like a book that we read that has paragraphs of text. Uh, so I totally look to board games all the time. I look to them to see um, what new resources are they playing with? What new mechanics do they have? Are there things I can do with that and I could bring into anything I'm doing? Obviously, I think at the same time, tabletop role-playing games and board games are wildly different. Uh, and there, those differences mean it's never an easy one-to-one. -one. At its most basic, that thing I said of like, I design the game, I have to do everything I can to give you the tools, and then you actually make it come to life at the table. Well, that's not really a board game thing. You need the players, right? And, and the players make it come to life in the sense that they play the game, but they don't make it come to life the way that a GM and players of a tabletop role-playing game do who are making their decisions, who are putting their creativity, who are investing their emotions. When I play Twilight Imperium, like I'm playing it according to the rules. It's possible for you to pl pluck me out, put somebody else into my seat, and it'll play similarly because they're facing the similar situation. Uh, they might, I don't know, hate the guy next to me more than I do. And so they'll play a little differently in that regard, but it's nowhere near the same thing as if you pluck me out and put somebody else in, they're playing a totally different character than I am. They're like in every way, they're making different decisions than I would. They're an entirely different ingredient in the mix. So it's this knowing that like, I'm never gonna take everything from board game because I can't, they're different media. Uh, but I can definitely be inspired. I can definitely learn from the board game and I can definitely see how, what is the board game doing that I can uh, take away and use to my benefit. What are the resources that it's playing with? I mean, and obviously, Root, the role-playing game, uh, derives a ton of stuff from the board game and from the mechanics for the Vagabond in particular, but also just for our understanding of how those different factions operate. Uh, I drew an enormous amount from the board game to even make any of those uh, decisions. Nowadays, like, I look at things... Uh, oh, it escapes my brain. Oh, no! Um, it's the latest Ryan Lockett game. Uh, uh, it's a giant big box, and it's green. <laughs> I can <laughs> see it. I just can't see the title. Anyway, it's, it's a great little, like, story-ish game where you're a little steamship, and you're going around all of these uh, weird islands. There are paragraphs of text, but it's got a system for combat and it's got all these different decisions and wild things that can that can happen and its combat system is interesting and all of that I look at and I'm like, this is obviously a board game, it's not an RPG, but there's stuff here that I can draw from. Is Can I think about how that combat system teaches me something? Can I think about how resource management in that game teaches me something? Can I think about how the characters in that game are represented and, and, and take it forward with me? All of that means that game has taught me something that I'm using in my next design uh, one way or another. And that happens over and over and over and over and over. So let's talk about uh, looking uh, at other designers, other, other sure. persons. In the world of RPG design, this is, uh, allow me to say it because you obviously can't, uh, many people point to Magpie Games and to you specifically as examples of people who are doing cool things, cool, uh, cool products, cool uh, games. But who do you or who does Brendan Conway uh, look at or, or who do you believe is doing something new, something interesting, something we should look at uh, in this moment? No? I mean, uh, 2023, hey, I've been reading about this game or, or this concept from this person of, or this other designer and 
he's onto something. He he's uh, he has found something that is worth uh, looking at. So I have to say things that are completely disconnected and haven't we, we haven't touched. I mean, I, I, I start with that preface because part of the issue, we like bringing in other designers. We like featuring them, helping them, giving them some of our resources. Uh, I have worked with Brandon Leon Gambetta for years on Pasión de las Pasiones. And so like, I love his work. It's obviously not entirely removed from me, but it's his. It's his because like, he's the one who knows telenovelas in a way that I don't. And it was just so awesome to work on that book with him and to continue to work with uh, him on the next book, uh, the, the next supplement for that line. Uh, and so similarly, you know, Evan Lee, or sorry, Whistler just released um, uh, Rapscallion. And uh, I know we have God Killer coming out soon. And so like, those are all great designs other people are doing that um, we are touching, but they're those people's designs. Uh, outside of us entirely though, I'd say uh, one of the big ones, I always love Kevin Crawford's work. Um, Kevin Crawford of Cena Nominee Publishing. Uh, Kevin did Stars Without Number uh, and now Worlds Without Number, but I played uh, so much Godbound. I, I love his game Godbound so much. We played years long campaign of that with so many sessions. It, it was another one of those, this is what I wanted kind of moments of uh, playing these over the top God powered characters using a system that's very D&D-esque but it made it about like, cool, at any given moment, you guys can just walk over this entire kingdom's worth of warriors. They're not they're not a match for you. So what do you do? Is that what you do? Because if that's what you do, that's fine. We can totally do that. You can, you can demand that you are now kings of this entire kingdom. So now you're kings of this entire kingdom. That's gonna cause so many headaches that you weren't expecting. I love it. Let's do this. Let's, it's gonna be great. Uh, so Godbound is amazing. Uh, everything Kevin has done is great, but Godbound is absolutely the one that I love the most. Uh, and then Void Heart Symphony uh, by Minerva McJanda, uh, published by Rowan Rick and Deckard. Uh, that's one that I am super psyched to play. I haven't actually gotten to yet. And I, I said it on a different uh, interview a little while back. I, this is also a game I had named. And I'm like, I still haven't managed to get it to the table. And I'm really annoyed that I still haven't actually gotten in there. Uh, but I'm super psyched for it because, like, it's building off of some of the P uh, PPTA stuff. It's building off of uh, Rhapsody of Blood, which I think was also Minerva. Um, Rhapsody of Blood is, like, supposed to be a, a Castlevania-style game using the legacy Life Among the Ruins uh, version of PBTA, which it was a great concept and they loved. But like this one is hitting the note of the Persona video games, uh, which I, I just adore. They hit that uh, teen superhero-ish kind of space, but in a completely different way. And they're much uh, more like surreal uh, with this alternate world and so many fun things and the JRPG mechanics and the social links and I love them so much so the fact that this game alone promised me hitting some of that space got me on board but it has a lot of interesting mechanics and ideas about the two worlds thing about the two sort of phases and flipping back and forth and what you can do in one versus the other really divvying up the two different kinds of gameplay. Uh, that's a space that I think is super interesting. Um, and this one is, uh, there, there've been a couple of other games that did that. Night Witches did sort of the day, uh, the pre-mission and the mission, but like Void Heart Symphony, especially with the trappings of of this uh, setting in the Persona style, I'm like, yeah, you got me. Yeah, I'm in, I'm in. Um, and at the moment I'm running uh, a long campaign for my friends of uh, Shadow of the Demon Lord. Mostly because a lot of them wanted D and D, and I'm like, all right, let's let's do something like D and D. But I want to try other things and see see what they do and what they don't do that I, that I might or might not like. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's not exactly uh, what Shadow of the Demon Lord is supposed to do, what we're doing, but we are having a really good time. Uh, so that's that's pretty fun. I I think after that, there's a lot of questions about where we would go next, but that's where I'm at. So we have um, a, a quick easy question. How are we doing time, guys? We hope, because we have uh, three more questions, but we don't want to abuse your, your time. I think I think we can hit the last three questions. Yeah, let's go for it. Perfect. So, well, go ahead. Excellent. Thanks. Um, so, looking to the past, what would you say are your biggest influences as a game designer? 
biggest influences as a game designer? Wow. Uh, <laughs> mm-hmm. I'd say... Uh, wow. Gosh. I mean, obviously, I, I can point to the Apocalypse World and, and cheat and do the simple cheap things and be like, <laughs> Apocalypse World is clearly a monumental turning post in my overall uh, design life. Uh, but I would say a lot of it as well is like the things I'm reading and the things that really uh, make me want to make a thing come to life. So for instance, masks for as much as it was me expressing it as much as it was, as it was that cover. Uh, I would say that there are like a couple of uh, important comics or shows that really made a huge difference. Young Justice is probably the most obvious of those of like, Watching Injustice was, I want this. How do I make a game that does this story? Because a lot of the time, that's what it'll be for me. It's like, I want I want this media. How do I continue this? How do I speak to this media in my own voice? How do I make a game that helps bring this to other people? At the moment, one of the big ones in my head is all of the From Software games, Elden Ring, Dark Souls, Demon Souls. I friggin' love those things. And I want like a way to speak back to them in my own voice with our own tools i want a way to talk more towards those uh so those are a giant influence as well i'll also call out because it's kind of an odd one but let me make sure i get the i get the name of the book correct um games agency as art is the name of the book games agency as art it's a book by uh professor c t win uh and it is a it's a philosophy book so it's like pretty technical and and thick but it's about games it's about how games are aesthetic it's about how they fit together it's a way of thinking of them that is really interesting and useful uh if you're deep into this nerd stuff um if you're thinking about design it's super interesting because it's asking questions about like um what is a game? Well, a game is an agency. A game is a, it creates a way of acting. So that presents a whole new framework by which you can think about your work. So even though it's a pretty recent book, um, I can't say like, I read it 10 years ago and it changed everything. Uh, I would say it's like a collection of ideas that both are new and pushing me forward. And they're a big influence on me today. And they kind of codify the inklings of ideas that we've had for the past however many years and it's like he's putting them into actual text so i'd say that is a really good one as well um yeah that and i mean it's it's hard because like everything that i play everything that i read at some level is having an influence armored society this thing i said is inspired by irish mythology is definitely influenced by the ulster cycle uh the time to Cooley, like the story of Cahulin, uh I want one where you can turn into a giant Hulk like warrior and fight people at a river and it's, I want a game that can do that I, w- I want a game that can do Irish mythology exactly for one to one so it's hard because everything has an influence but like Apocalypse World is an honest answer uh, because it was so important uh, these individual stories like playing Root for the first time was we love this board game what can we do with this? There's a reason why we went after it uh, in exactly the way we did. Uh, and I would say moving forward, this this book, Games Agency as Art, it's, it's technical, it's thick, it's dense, but it's really interesting. Okay, that's great information. Uh, we are going to say that. Um, so looking back as well, but from, the, from now, uh what would you say to your your brendan from the first steps into designing you look at that brendan and and what advice did you give him <laughs> you fool you fool <laughs> oh, what are you, you should doing? check this cover <laughs> right now <laughs> <laughs> just go just become an accountant do something else please no. this book I... <laughs> It's it's. Uh, it's all about PTA, oh. Brennan. <laughs> <laughs> Design blades in the dark. Uh, <laughs> it's a it's an interesting question because I think part of the what makes it really hard is all of this uh, art 
where we think of design as art. It, it is an act of, of art at some level. It is aesthetic. It is like it requires that investment. Um, it's always this sort of hubristic, like active naivete. You, you have to not know what you're getting into or else you might not get into it. Um, if you really understood up front how hard this was going to be and how much work and time and energy it was going to take, you might never actually get started. The fact that you don't know is a big help in getting you through it. Um, so there's an odd thing there where I wouldn't want to warn my younger self necessarily and say, man, you don't even know <laughs> what you don't know. You don't know how hard this is going to be. You don't know how much you're going to have to learn. You don't know how hard everything is going to be because that would discourage the younger me and that would like kick him out. It's true. It's, it's an actual truth, but like, it's the same thing with a lot of young artists. I wouldn't want to go to a young artist and really say to them, in order to finish this book, you're going to have to spend two to three years. You're going to be thinking about it all the time. You're going to need a team of people who are going to have to fill in all the gaps in your own lack of expertise. Like, you need to do all of this stuff, and it's going to be really hard. And even then, it might not be a success. You can't tell for sure until you actually put it out into the world. Good luck. That's so disheartening to hear. It's true. But the actual thing that's important is what I would probably say to myself and what I would say to a lot of young artists who are trying to get into the space we're thinking about it. That work is worth it. Even if in the end, like you come out and, and unfortunately it doesn't sell. That The first book I said, Angle Kite, that I put out, I'm so happy with and proud of and it doesn't sell at all compared to anything else that we've done. Like as a commercial product, it's more or less a flop at this point but I love it. I'm still so happy I did it. And it's still super important on my overall growth as a designer. So the most important pieces are both knowing that even though it's going to push you so hard, harder than you think, it's worth it to push, to grow, to learn, even if the end product doesn't sell because you will have made something. And then the second thing that I would say is the you got to make the next thing. You got to keep going forward. You don't stop. Masks was great. I'm really proud of it. I, I'm not going to stop at masks. I'm going to go on to the next thing. Avatar, we're probably never going to have a Kickstarter that is ever <laughs> as successful as Avatar ever again. That doesn't mean we stop. That doesn't mean we're done. It doesn't mean we reach the end. We did everything we came here to do. We keep going. This, the questions you guys asked about like, PBTA and are we done with it? They're not about necessarily like, is it flawed or, or are we like, boo, the system is failing. It's not, they're about like, we've said a lot and we want to keep moving. We want to keep going to the next thing and the next thing and the next thing and constantly pushing forward is so important because it's, it's like, I think about Stephen King sometimes and how many books he has made. And of course, if you make that many books, some of them are bad. Some of them are not as good as others. But that's okay, because he just keeps going to the next thing. That's like the most important thing you can do. You can say, I did it. This time it didn't work out. What am I going to do differently next time? How am I going to do better? What am I going to try to say something new, to do something different? What did I learn and what can I take forward? That's the essence of this entire process. And the very last piece I would say like that I kind of knew at that time, I was getting the benefit of even if I couldn't put it into words. But this is deeply important for any new artist entering the space. And I would have really emphasized this. Having a team is everything. Having these other people that you can work with and talk to about your work, that you can uh, ask for advice, that they can provide some of the skills that you lack or they can guide you to develop those skills yourself that makes an enormous difference. Sometimes that can be a community, having just a community of people that you can talk to and chat with and say, this is the new thing I got, what do you got? And then they have to be able to give you honest, real feedback, including this kind of stinks. Try again, do, do it again. Like that is so valuable though, to have a team that you can trust because you're never really actually gonna be able to do this entirely on your own. It's just, it's not possible. No creator, like, yeah, your name is on the front of the book, uh, you know, but I, I've heard Brandon Sanderson 
the fantasy author, right? He's always like, this is my team, though. I had all of these people read the book, give me feedback. I have editors. I have marketing people. I obviously have a publisher. I have such a massive team. His name's on the front of the book. And let's not undervalue the work he did. But he knows let's not undervalue the work all of those other people did that made this thing come to life. So you starting off, young Brendan, value that team, stick with that team, develop that team. I'm fortunate because that worked out. Like the team we have at Magpie is amazing. And uh, I wouldn't have been able to do the things I did without them. And I, I would like to think I have also contributed to the things everybody else here has done in their own way. It's so massively important to have this group, this community, to really build and work with them. Uh, so if, for sure, if you're starting off, don't think you need to be the sole genius. Don't think you need to be, you need to do everything yourself and solve it yourself. Helping other people and them helping you is the key to how this actually gets done. So what can we expect from Brendan Conway or Magpie Games in the near future? And where can we find about it? Nice. Uh, so I personally am still working on a bunch of things for Avatar. Uh, we're, we're talking about Avatar Republic City uh, as our next supplement. Like that's, that's coming out. So I am doing a lot of work on that. I'm still working with Brandon on Pasión de las Pasiones. So a lot of the things I'm doing are sort of helping and advising and guiding on these other things. Obviously, Republic City is in Avatar fashion. So many awesome people doing a lot of awesome work that I'm adding to, contributing to, guiding. So it's this giant ball of awesome people working together on it. Uh, after that, I think there, there are a couple of other things I'm still also working on. I am uh, helping to dev edit Urban Shadows, uh, second edition. So that's another one of our big Magpie projects. But moving forward, uh, the biggest thing that probably I'm on the schedule for is Armored Society, this game I talked about. It's still a ways away from uh, completion, uh, probably a ways away from even playtesting, but it's the thing that I, I had brought up years ago and we were all excited for. And there's uh, a lot of interesting things there about us building a new system that tries to answer these bigger questions uh, about what we want to do next and what PBTA doesn't do. So what other spaces can we fill in? So I don't want to promise that as like, look for it next year, because don't hold me to that deadline. <laughs> that, that sounds terrible. Uh, but keep an eye out for it. We'll be saying things about it as we go forward. Uh, you can always find out about our stuff through uh, Magpie Games Twitter. That's at Magpie Official. You can find out about our stuff on our website, on our Facebook page. Uh, that, I believe that one's just Magpie Games. And we have a Discord, which is thriving and full of people uh, talking about the stuff all the time. We answer these questions all the time. Uh, they get flung at us through the Discord. And we'll answer them. Uh, the Discord is actually just so cool in general. I would say if anybody's interested in our stuff, it's a great place to go and get these additional resources because the, one of the best feelings as a game designer um, is when somebody asks a rules question. And my first thing is like, oh, God, did I, did I mess up my description? Did I mess up my explanation? Oh, God. And then somebody else chimes in and answers the first person's question. And I'm like, yeah. So, oh, that's so good. Oh, it makes me so happy. Uh, that's one of the best feelings I could possibly have. So the, I would say our Discord in general is a great place to uh, pay attention to all the games that we've done and get advice on anything. But also we do a lot of announcements there and updates on our new stuff. Whoa. Whoa. Thanks a lot, Brennan. Yep. Uh, we, we, are, we are a team that's called Notis y Dragones. And... We are starting this year with the interviews, and it's amazing to have you here. Hell yeah, it was my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. <sighs> thank you, uh, uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, Brendan, in name not only of uh, La Taberna de Road, El Bardo del Deide, and Tomate uh, 20, and uh, uh, all the people that are watching this in the future. So uh, look ahead for more interviews here in Notice y Dragones. And we'll see you next time. Bye bye.